How do you say that? Oh, no. -E you remember Durst is the worst. Ah! Durst the worst, bitch! <laughs> Durst the worst, bitch! Durst the worst, bitch! Durst the worst, bitch! He has been socialized and tilted in such a way and in such a favor. Uh, racism had a, a Facebook posting that went viral, got like 38, reached 38,000 people, and it was one of those postings from Twitter. Someone could, you know, could, we put a lot of Twitter stuff on our Facebook page. It's talking about that, that black folks in this country really have had only some semblance of freedom for 50 years. And we're talking about the civil rights movement, and I said some semblance, I didn't say all. I said some. But who's had the freedom since they came here because they don't have, they don't have this. They can't, I'm distinguishable from, from white folks when I enter a room. That's something that you don't encounter. And most white folks don't see themselves as being white or anything else. They just see it's just being. But wherever I go, I see color all the time because I see sometimes I'm the only black person in the room. And I'll just, uh, I won't reiterate because you guys made some great points and I agree with them. Uh, but the one thing that I will say that as a black man growing up here in the city of Milwaukee, um, I was told and I was, it was reinforced to me that my life mattered at an early age. Um, I remember, you know, when I was in the third grade, right, I ended up getting suspended from school because being this, uh, this white girl I actually kissed and the teacher caught us. And the girl that actually asked me for a kiss, right? So uh, I get suspended and I go home and my mom was like, what happened? I was like, hey, this girl came up to me and told me she wanted to kiss me. And so she kissed me and then the teacher saw it and then there was a huge uproar. Um, and so I ended up you know, basically getting kicked out of school at an early age. And so I learned from that experience that you know, being a young black male, I was going to be looked at and treated differently in certain circles or in certain situations. Um, I also remember when I was eight, uh, and uh, my uncle married a white lady and we, he moved to Oshkosh. And race was not a big thing that was talked about in my community because most people were black. So we didn't have to have those conversations other than, hey, watch out when you go here. You know, when you go to the mall, look out. Um, and so I remember when I was eight and there was a white girl at this place called Shakey's in uh, Oshkosh. And we were playing the balls and she, and I was there with my other cousins who were white and she came up to me and she said, why are you black? I said, why am I black? I said, well, because my mama made me that way. Um, but it was those sorts of things that for me as a black man, I realized early and potentially often that I would be questioned. I would be questioned on whether or not I should be at a certain place. I would be questioned on whether or not I would fit in. I would be questioned based on, you know, even some of my abilities and whether or not my accomplishments were my accomplishments of uh, being a young black man. Um, and so for me, the, the idea of Black Lives Matters for me as a black man has always been something that's been put at the forefront of my life. I remember when I first got my license and my uncle said, don't tint your windows. It gives them a reason to pull you over. And so I'm 40 years old and to this day I've never had tint on my windows because of that reason. He also said, never drive with more than two people in the car because that gives them another reason to pull you over. So no matter how big my car was or how many people I could fit in, I always only had two people. And he also said, you know what, when you're driving, never wear a hat. Because that's another one of those things that somebody will pick up on that will give them just a reason to want to pull you over. And so unfortunately, throughout my entire life, I've had to go through life experiencing what it means to be black. You know, and not always from a positive. You know, my family reinforced the positivity of what it meant to be black. And so I was reading books. I remember when I was probably 13 and I read Soul on Ice. And it was a revolutionary book for me. Um, and even now, you know, uh, as I think about my education, and, and I focus on history a lot. And when I think about Black Lives Matter, similar to what other people said, it's because black lives have not mattered to most people. Um, and so when you think about it again, you know, blacks being here as slaves and being treated as property, uh, you know, basically being counted as three-fifths a person, uh, for whatever reason, American society chooses to turn a blind eye to our history. And unfortunately, it's that same history that other nations around the world judge us on, and we don't judge ourselves on that same history. 
And so the way that we have treated our own, really, we have to come to grips with that. And that really starts mm -hmm. with people saying, you know what, I might not have been the person cracking the whip, but I can validate and verify that whip cracking happened. And I can validate and verify that, you know, from, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation to Jim Crow to segregation to the Civil Rights Movement, which again, if we're talking about late 60s, how long have black people really had a chance? And now we're dealing with a population of young people who have, you know, who are educated, who get it, who see the disparities in the world, and if they choose not to conform or to assimilate, they're asking themselves this simple question. Why and for what purpose? To put time and effort and energy in trying to be a good person, a good role model, of, you know, an academic scholar or, or whatever, why, when no matter what I do, I can walk into a place and I can be disregarded just because of the color of my skin. And so really, you know, when you think about Black Lives Matter, it's similar to what other people have said, yes, all lives matter, but lives matter to those lives that really most people could care less about. So when we think about all of the causes that we fight as a country, you know, uh, it always, you know, it sort of makes me laugh sometimes when I'm watching commercials and, you know, I see, you know, all of these ads for people who are looking for help for dogs and pandas and all of these other things. And I'm just saying, you know what, do they not see that we have a problem here in America and that, yeah, you can save a dog, but why not save a person? Uh, wouldn't that be more of everybody's, you know, uh, sort of, you know, wheelhouse to be able to say that, hey, we have to come together to contribute to something because we've identified a problem and the, the solution are people. But for whatever reason, uh, Blacks have a hard time finding white allies, quite frankly. And we get it, you know, part of it is because, you know, most white people have lived in certain areas their entire life, have been groomed, and, you know, sort of the path that they've had or the path that they were going to be on was already made for. Yeah. It was, you come from this, you will be this, you will go and do this, you will have experiences, and for black people, it's really been the luck of the draw. It is, where do you live? And then more importantly, who do you have in your life that's going to give you value when everybody else tells you that you don't have any? So um, I'll get off my soapbox and then I'm sure that we have some questions. Uh, so I'll take a few more questions. So here's a, a second question. And this is about Black Lives Matter, um, the movement itself. So what do you see um, are the things that are needed in that movement um, to, to, to really make it alive and make it a movement? So, and, and this is open to everyone, too, so. Yes, here, let me give you a microphone. I just want to say, I guess most people here consider themselves Christians, and um, I, I, I grew up in a church that's very diverse, and um, I, I'm sorry, I, I go to a church that's very diverse, and um, got a lot of friends from all different backgrounds, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and just didn't really think much of anything until I was sitting with some friends and um, a friend of mine shared that, well, her husband shared that um, he was uh, tackled outside of his job on his way to work and he hadn't done anything wrong. He just happened to be black in the wrong place at the wrong time. And his boss came out and said, hey, this is my employee, what are you doing? Well, you fit a description. And I thought, that stinks. And, um, and an elderly woman that I know, she's she gets pulled over all the time. And she's like the sweetest person ever. <clears throat> she's like my grandmother. And when she told me that, I was like, what? And just, you know, another friend that um, worked in a coffee shop for years. She's a barista, and they didn't want to hire her at a certain place. And she kind of looked around, she felt like, oh, I think it's because I'm black. And not because of my skills. And, uh, you know, a couple other friends of ours, young men that were having a hard time finding a job, and and I just started putting two and two together and realizing, oh my God, this is this is real, and I've been blind to it my whole life because I just grew up white and everything just kind of, you know, it's a white-driven society, and um, I, I read this this scripture that it, it's Philippians two three. It says. Um, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility consider others better than yourselves. And that, to me, for any Christian, is if we do that, we will go a long way. And um, 
and I know we've got to seek social justice, but I feel like it starts with us, you know, and um, God's got to be the center of it, because you can put politics or whatever you want into it, and it's, it's never solved anything before, and it won't, but um, if we just do what God tells us to do, everything will work out, and we can, we can be unified. Thank you. So you were asking about resources for the movement. Um, and I'll just think about myself, because like I said, I'm not a member. I have my, my own org that does its own work. Uh, but when I think about what is it that I need to continue to do the long, sustainable work, um, I wish I could say I could get some space and some time to think. We, um, a lot of times, are only able to be really reactive. There are so many different issues in the black community, we can talk about the mass incarceration, we can talk about the police brutality, we can talk about joblessness, we can talk about food deserts. What else can we talk about? Education. Edu oh my goodness, education. education. Yeah, so the, like, the, the list crime. is ongoing, <laughs> and so sometimes you can get really unaligned and unfocused because you're almost like an octopus because you want to, and I have a heart for people, so you, you want to kind of like reach and expand and do all this other stuff. So sometimes if I could just get some space and time, like I just took a whole month off of work in December just because I needed to clear my brain. I needed space to come back to work in 2019 and realign my ideas and my thoughts around how I want to move the next campaign forward and the work that we're doing. So sometimes it's just space. Sometimes we need resources. Resources can be your time, resources can be your talent, resources can be your money, resources can be your business, resources can be you opening your mouth. So a lot of times, like I think Lisa was just saying, we need accomplices. We need people who are going to speak up and help to disrupt the white supremacy that is happening in places that we are in all day, every day. These are not conversations that Lisa and I and Marco can go and have all day, every day. Like that's, that's not where our energy is gonna be well spent. We need people who can go in places and disrupt the norm. Disrupt it, you can do it in a God-fearing way, you can do it really nicely, really sweetly, however you need to do it. But like you said, recognize that People are supposed to, we're supposed to look at people that are, are better than us. We're supposed to be serving people. How can you sit alongside someone like me, Lisa, or Marco, and say that you're serving us or you're standing with us, but you won't speak up when you hear something that's way out of line and you know that it's out of line, and then you're convicted too, right? Because we're Christians, so we get convicted. The Spirit is supposed to convict us, and if it convicts you, don't turn a blind eye to what it is that you're feeling in your heart. You have to be bold and courageous, and you have to speak up and say something. And saying something is gonna take a lot of courage for some of us, because it's something that we've never done. I've never, like I said, you know, I've never um, thought that I would be in this position, but the first time I held a bullhorn and actually went to um, speak, uh, the family of Dontre Hamilton asked me to speak at a rally that Trump was at prior to him uh, becoming president. And I'm like, me? He was like, oh yeah, it's Amy Marquesi, you can do it. I had to be courageous because it wasn't just, you know, um, they wanted me to go and speak. No, this family needed someone to be a voice for Dontre. And we need voices in places that are going to do something way different. It's time for something like extreme radical type stuff because the way our nation is looking right now, I mean, you guys are silent and quiet right now, but I know everybody has something in the brain like, oh yeah, that's, you're right. So I think for me, I need space um, to be able to regroup, realign, and think of the next strategy because we're always strategizing um, to figure out what it is that we can do to better um, our community so that they can thrive. And we are pushing for liberation. We need to be free from the systems that are continuously oppressing us. I need resources to do this work. A lot of people um, don't want to resource police money for, and so that is something that I look for. I look for people who want to support my work financially. I look for people who have skills, who can do things that are going to help me continue to be at the front of what it is I need to do, but also sustaining my back, if that is something that someone chooses to do.